The moment is here, you can stop your search, it's Comics by Perch. Hey everybody, this is Perch. And how do you know you're on the wrong track? For a lot of people who are armchair commentators, uh, like me, like a lot of you in the comments, like the people who have lots of opinions and suggestions on social media for these companies, guess what? A lot of your opinions and suggestions are, are good ones. You, as a, as a customer, as a fan, as who knows what, you have two advantages that a lot of people inside these companies do not have. One, you are the customer, and you're, in theory, I hope, very in touch with yourself. You probably talk to other customers, so you have a pretty good sense of your group. Now, in fairness, your group may be small, maybe a bubble, maybe a bunch of people who are very like-minded, may not represent a significant majority, but you do have a finger on at least some aspect of customers. And in many cases, as we've talked about before, and I, I can't stress it enough, there are uh, there's a, a deep level of abstraction that takes place between between the customers and the publishers. Very, very deep. Um, in many cases, the people who are making comics, who are creating them, the artists, the writers, all the rest, they have very little interaction with the customers unless they personally take it upon themselves to go meet and greet them. And, and many do, so some do, some don't. But it's a self it's self-generated action. I think it's always good, but the publisher is not pushing them to do that. Something to recognize. The other th advantage you have as a fan, as a customer, is that you are unencumbered by rules. You're the reader. You do not have editorial mandates. You do not have a Tom Brevoort or Dan Didio or whoever it happens to be uh, coming to you, uh, your office and saying, yeah, your idea is good, but maybe tweak it in these 5,000 ways. You're able to just, you know, what they call greenfield, come up with ideas. And in many cases, those ideas are good ones, but may not be realistic given everything that's going on. What's an example of this that's a, that's a fair thing? But I don't know. Maybe the company is publishing 80 comics and they simply do not have operational distribution room to create your multi-part crossover. Maybe they're in a contract negotiation with the writer that you want to have on your title and, and that writer is not interested in doing it. Let's say pay them something in excess of their budget that they can pay. There's, there's lots of things that go on in the background, very boring, very mundane things that are not terribly exciting. They don't make good videos. They're not, uh, you know, they're not, they're, not, they're not catchy titles for people, but they're real factors when you're running a business. Anyone who's run a business will tell you that there are plenty of factors that are not glamorous, but heavily impact their ability to operate. Taxes is a good example of one. If you've been a small business owner, taxes turns out to be something that heavily impacts your business and what you can do with it. Nobody gets super excited about taxes unless they get so extreme that you can then, you know, make a big show of it. But generally speaking, things like a minor rent, rent, <laughs> rent increase, uh, some kind of zoning thing that your city is doing for parking, maybe somebody passes. There's lots of goofy things that can impact your business on a day-to-day -day basis. They're just factors to consider. But in general, the problem that the publishers have, and this is an area where I think that the customers and the fans, and some of the creators, but not all, are in a better position than the publishers. And that is that the fans and the customers are, they, they're more aware of problems. What I mean by that, it's like a radar. Your, your radar is tuned more to incoming problems than the publisher. Why is that? Well, first off, you have more time. You're the customer. You're picking up a comic book. You're reading it. You're thinking about uh, what it's going to take to get a dollar out of your pocket to buy another comic book. These are all things that are on your mind, and you're highly tuned to factors that when you're you know, 30,000 feet back from it, publishing the entire line, you tend to miss to you going into a comic shop, putting two or three comics down on the you know, counter, and them saying that will be $18, it hits you in a way that the publishers typically don't get. They're looking at a giant lineup of comics. They're looking at Excel sheets. They're going, hey, you know, this uh, comic that we're going to print you know, four months from now, uh, let's go uh, price that at uh, $7.95. I don't know. We could use an $8 comic. Uh, why not? Go, let's, let's do that. And they are not tuned in to the realities of the retail shop of your wallet. And now, by the way, you can say at this moment that is absurd, and they should be, and you are not wrong. 
But it is easier said than done if you have an organization that is just not built for things like that. And think about for a moment, comic books and the big publishers in particular have built themselves a system that in many ways protects and abstracts them from all the warning signs that they should naturally be getting. I'm talking about warning signs like, hey, are these these rate increases starting to drive down purchase of multiple titles? Are these events coming in too fast? Are, is, there, is there fatigue of a character? These are all things that if you look at the current publisher system, where you have senior editorial, which tends to be well, you have management, which is completely abstracted and removed. I've got a friend who works at Marvel who says he hasn't seen or heard a uh, one of the senior managers of Marvel in a year and a half. And there's been emails, but got nothing, just nothing. Now, I have a hard time believing that because I can swear some of the senior managers have done Zoom calls and company things and everything, but maybe not. I, I don't know. You tell me. You, you More of you tell me. Is that what's going on there? But there's... <laughs> There is a, there's a huge gap. And then between senior editorial and, and, let's say, more junior editorial, there's another huge gap. And then between editorial and the creators that are hired as freelancers to come in and do the book, there's yet another massive gap. And then between the creators, you've got this entire very kludgy, you know, first of all, timeline, where what you're working on is three to six months ahead of going out to shops. And recently, people have worked on things that have taken a year and a half to go out. There's been there's been weird delays where stuff just sits on the shelf. Nobody knows the decision they're going on. And then past that, you've got the customer. And, you know, the retailers have not done an amazing job of connecting with their customers as a whole. Some retailers are good at it. They have a good relationship. They know what sells in their store. They know what goes on. But many are not. You, you, you could be a completely anonymous customer. You probably are in several stores. And that, that's just how it is. That's the, that's the business that's been established there. These factors are, uh, n- none of these are good, but all of them add up to basically set the publisher as far away from the customer as possible, unless the publisher takes active active steps, hard work, in order to connect with their buying audience. Most publishers are not. In fact, I would say, again, the politics and gravity of working for a company that rolls into Warner Media and Disney is such that, you know, when do you have time for that? You're, you're busy making sure that your goals are looking good, that your strat plan for the next three years is properly buttoned up in Excel and that the PowerPoint graphics are looking a certain way, and you had somebody from McKinsey come in and maybe do an analysis on uh, kind of your logo and packaging design, and then beyond that, you've got to go in front of the number of execs, and you know what you'd really like is a better office over there in, in Tower B. And I mean, like, this is the kind of stuff that's going through their head. Now, I'm not saying this is an excuse, and there's going to be one of you jackasses that's going to come into... <laughs> I'm just kidding... I love my audience, but uh, but there's always one jackass who comes in and it's like, oh, here's Perch. Perch is saying that all the publishers are completely innocent and they are just uh, they're just doing the best they can and we're a bunch of jerks for a questioning. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying this is how it actually this is how it is in those companies and the publishers must should must whatever forceful word you want to use here. Find ways to break through all that BS and connect with their customer base. They absolutely must. But they have a number of factors working against them to do that. Factors they themselves created. It's not your fault. It's not the retailer's fault. It's not the fan's fault. It's not the customer's fault. It's not even the creator's fault in a lot of cases. The publishers have set up a system that basically positions them as far away from the customer as possible. And then, at times, although it's rare, they will pop their head up and wonder why they seem so out of touch, why the big marketing campaign didn't work. An example of this, the J.J. Abrams and Sons Spider-Man. There was some serious questioning around the Marvel offices of why that went so wrong, why the sales were so poor, why the marketing was so disjointed, why they did this uh, big billing of, of this, uh, you know, this J.J. Abrams coming in only to have Abrams announce a relatively short time later that he had signed some working agreements with Warner Media, their, their competitor. Like, that, there was a lot going on there. And there, there was some real head-scratching, almost soul-searching at Marvel of how come this went so bad? 
why didn't the customers go for it? J.J. Abrams is a big name. People don't know his son, but, you know, we had disguised that fairly well. And Sarah Pacelli is, you know, I, I, I think people like her, right? I mean, we hear people like her. Why, why didn't this sell 150,000 plus copies? You know what some of the internal estimates for that comic were? I shit you not. They were a quarter million for issue one was the expectation. It did not make that. The other issues were all being touted as being over 150. They didn't remotely make that. They missed those numbers hard. And they're, they're, they're serious. How could this be? Well, if they had connected more with the customers, they could have seen that one coming. They, the story that was written clearly was not going to land well with the customer base that could drive those numbers. The people who are not into comics, they were not going to be drawn over to a book sold into the direct market by J.J. Abrams. They just weren't. Abrams was not a big draw in that market enough to get people who like his movies to wander into a comic shop. And by the way, you, you spent zero money on marketing and advertising to that group. So what did you think was going to happen? Well, exactly what did happen. Well, my point here is that if a business has to be successful, it has to set up the early warning flags, the signals, the, the alerts, whatever it happens to be, to actually get ahead of these problems, to, to know when they're off track, to be able to say, Ah, if I if I don't um, if I don't protect myself against A, B, and C here, the result's going to be bad. But if you completely remove yourself from the customer base, and the publishers have again some some fault of their own, some just natural gravity of working for a corporation. But if you go to a there's what's often fascinating to me, and I can end with this is is the Walt Disney Company has something called the Disney Institute. You may have heard of it. If not, go look it up. The Disney Institute prides itself on giving management courses to companies about how to better connect with their audience, how to have a better business. There's a book called Be Our Guest, which basically explains why you must treat your audience as if they're your guests. I, I'm not making it up. It's there. It's something the company is extremely proud of. There are groups within Disney that take these lessons absolutely to heart. There's a reason why, for whatever else you think of them, their theme parks tend to deliver the experience people are looking for, so much so that people put mortgages on their house in order to afford a trip to Disney World. It's that much of a draw. People who go in, go all in. That's an example of it working well. But other parts of the company seem to have not learned that lesson, have used the corporation like many other corporations to protect themselves as far as possible from their customers. It's not all size fits, it's not one size fits all, put it that way. Uh, this is a key factor of what it means to work in a big company. You have to connect with your customers. You have to break through the natural barriers that a corporation sets up. Uh, it's interesting to me that right now, one of the smartest things that these the big publishers could do is hire a handful of you know fans to come in as consultants and basically say, hey, we're going to give you a vantage point from the outside of how things look and how they're doing. And you know the company in turn has to be willing to listen. That would be smart to do. But anyway, that's that's quite a bit of um, it's quite a bit that I'm asking for here. Anyway, let me know your thoughts on connecting with your customers. Thanks for listening.